Einen wunderschönen guten Abend in der alten Schmiede und im Livestream. Ich begrüße Sie zum heutigen Programm, das der Komponisten, Dirigentin und Violinistin Lauren Bernowski gewidmet ist. Ich freue mich sehr, dass Lauren heute hier anwesend sein konnte. Und ich ähm, kurz zur Biografie von Lauren Bernowski. Sie wurde 1967 in äh, Rochester, Minnesota geboren, ist dann äh, zur Schule, also zur Musikschule, Hart School of Music, New England Conservatory und hat dann ein Doktorat bei Lucas Foss in, in der Boston University gemacht. Sie ist besonders bekannt durch ihre Werke für Blechbläser. Sie hat aber fast wie alle Formate in ihrem, in ihrem Werkkatalog vertreten. Und heute werden wir auch ein paar Werke hören, die sehr repräsentativ für sie sind. Ein paar sind auch pädagogische Werke. Ich möchte Jetzt auch kurz ansagen, äh, unser Sänger heute, der Angelo Polak, äh, war die letzten Tage ein bisschen krank. Und äh, ja, äh, nur dass Sie wissen, äh, vielleicht äh, kann man das ein bisschen merken sogar. Aber äh, ich freue mich sehr, dass er trotzdem heute auftreten wird. Ja, ähm, die Komponistin wird durchs Programm äh, auch führen. Ich freue mich sehr. Äh, aber erstmal hören wir das erste Stück, äh, Song, Song of the Phoenix. Spielt Andrea Nikolic. Viel Vergnügen.
switch to English now to present you uh, Lauren Bernowski. <laughs> Welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much. Do we have a sound in, in the room? Testing. Yes. Test, okay. test, test, test. I, I don't hear anything. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, okay. The next piece, uh, The Secret Philosopher, is a work that uh, for tenor and, um, and piano, based on uh, poems by Norma beversdorf Fletzitz. Uh, I, uh, I know these this poems were uh, pub published in a posthumous way. They were found under her bed. Um, how was your approach to this, uh, to this composition, and how did you come to this text? Well, it's actually a lovely story. Um, behind how this piece came about. Um, I was commissioned to write it as a birthday present. Um, the person who commissioned it, her uh, name is uh, Vicki King, and, her, and she's a pianist, and she performs a lot with her husband, Tom King, who's a tenor, and she asked me to write a piece that she could present to her husband as a birthday present, and she was friends with a woman who had just passed away um, named Norma beversdorf Resitz, and um, these poems were just about to be published in a book at that time. And I came up with the title Secret Philosopher because during her lifetime, um, Norma didn't want people to read her poetry. And I believe she told one of her family members um, that I have some poems, but you can only see them after I've passed away. And indeed, um, one of the family members found a box of these poems, many, many, like hundreds apparently of poems, under her bed. And um, they took some of the poems and published them into a volume. And um, Vicki sent me a copy of this book. And she said, take a look at these. And you know, uh, does this poetry speak to you? Do you think we could maybe use this as the setting for Tom's birthday present? And I love these poems. They're all very short. And they're very, gosh, she, she's a fantastic poet. But it was a sort of a secret that she was a poet. She didn't want people to, she certainly wasn't sharing her work until after she had passed away. So that's why I came up with the title, The Secret Philosopher. So these are very short poems, so I think we don't have enough um, text in, uh, when, if, if, uh, for a uh, traditional song form. How did you approach the, the composition? Yeah, well, some of these poems were only two or three lines long. So, um, and the, the resulting songs are pretty short, but I do recycle. I'll use the same line several times. Don't be unnerved, don't be unnerved, don't be unnerved, several times. Otherwise, it would be about what, three seconds long for each song. Thank you very much. Now we hear the secret, secret philosopher for tenor and piano, uh, Angelo Polak and Enrico Muramoto.
vacant locks, a dreamy boy with brown and tender eyes, a castle builder with his wooden blocks and towers that touch imaginary skies. Imaginary skies.
little bit more about the last piece we uh, heard uh, for violin. This is your instrument also. Uh, there are, but the, I think the most uh, played uh, works from you are mostly wind instruments like the flute sonatine or the trumpet concerto or works for, um, for a trombone. Uh, What's your relationship? Uh, what's your relation with the wind instruments and with your instrument, the violin? Violin. Gosh, I, I'm not quite sure how it happened that I'm sort of the darling of the trombone world, but somehow this is a thing. Um, violin is my instrument. I started it when I was uh, seven years old, and that's why I can write so virtuosically for it because I know it really works. Um, and um, Maybe it's because the wind players of the world, especially the brass, they don't have as long a history, as large a repertoire of classical music. There's no Beethoven trombone sonata, or there's, a, there's so much more music that the strings have that their string players tend not to be looking for new music because it takes us so long just to learn all the concertos already written for our instrument. But in the brass world, there aren't so many concertos written. So they're looking for a lot more repertoire, so brass players tend to be more open to trying out new stuff. And so I've had a number of players ask me to write pieces for them. And I sort of take my musical know-how that I they picked up um, from playing the violin, from playing a lot of great violin music. And I applied it as best I could to writing for brass. So, Could you also say that in the U.S. there is this big, uh, there are much more um, uh, people playing brass instruments because in high school they, they play a lot of uh, brass uh, and, and symphonic uh, band music. That because I, now that I think there are other composers from the U.S. like Evanson mm -hmm. that are also very uh, famous for their brass pieces, um, there is a lot of people playing that in the U.S. No? I suppose so. I, I've never lived here enough to know what the sort of brass tradition is, but I know that the U.K. has a brass band tradition, but we do have... Um, in our school systems, a lot of bands. Like um, there are more bands in our like elementary, middle, and high schools. More bands than string orchestras. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a, it's a big thing, I guess, in the United States. And I, I'm, it's interesting for me to come to another country and hear you talk about that because for me that's just how things are. And I, so it's kind of interesting to think about for me. And we come to the next piece that uh, is uh, a, a premiere. And it's uh, an aria uh, uh, from your newest opera that hasn't been premiered yet about Anton Schmidt, the Viennese uh, Holocaust hero. So, uh, how did you come to this uh, subject? Oh, I'm so excited about this tonight, I have to say. Well, it all started actually with my husband, who's back here. Um, he discovered an article about Anton Schmidt um, from the, probably going to, murder this, trying to say it, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung from the year, gosh, I guess the article was written around the year 2000, and, um, and he was reading to me about this and translating from my German, it's not so great, and um, he was telling me, you know, about this incredible figure, this incredible hero from the Holocaust that I'd never heard of, and he, who's German, he had never heard of him either, and I thought, this is a person whose story really deserves to be told, and I want everyone to know the story. Um, as a composer, I could just think about writing pretty melodies, but one of the things I do think about is how to use my talent, if I can call it that, to do some good in the world. And by bringing attention to Anton Schmidt and what he did, he was, he was just, a, just one of many people who were drafted to work for the Nazis, and he worked by himself at huge risk to himself, and he ended up saving two to almost 300 Jews. And um, when, I apply, when I think about that in terms of our modern daily life, if there were more people who followed their conscience and acted even by themselves you know, against the large fascist machine or whatever that the force is, this world could truly be a better place. And anyway, so this is why I thought I would write an opera. I love opera, and I have wanted to write a major opera for a long time, and I thought, this, this is the time in my life to do that. And, and when, when do we happen to, to hear the whole opera? Uh, 
Gosh, that's an interesting question. Um, I have only written a few arias from this opera so far, and in fact, I'm writing the libretto, the story behind it, myself, and so this project is going to take me maybe another two to three years, but I will let you know. I will invite you to the premiere Thank you. when and if it happens. Um, I would like to um, say one thing. I'll mm -hmm. practice my German here a minute. Es freut mir, es freut mir sehr, dass um, heute Abend haben wir die Enkelin von Anton Schmidt und ihr Mann mit uns. Und ich muss sagen, vielen, vielen Dank, Herr und Frau Kellermann. Dann, uh, I will present uh, uh, Angelo Pollack in uh, Eric Muramoto, the last letter from the opera The Mensch. Lauren Brzezinowski. Thank you. 
Everything. 
das nächste soll einen Hund darstellen. Die Frau Bild kann das einigermaßen machen. <lacht> the last piece uh, of this concert but before I would like to talk about the two last uh, songs we heard or uh, arias uh, they, these are from uh, these operas are from, for yes children's operas I I love kids love opera and I love writing opera for kids so sung by professionals as you saw and but for young audiences because I think that we need to make sure that we have an audience for opera 20, 30, 40 years down the road. So I'd like to keep, like, get kids to love opera, hopefully. Anyway, so I have, I have written two young audience operas. And um, first we heard I Am the King of the Jungle. That is from Amuch the Magnificent. And King of the Jungle is a lion. So that's where you heard. And it, it's about, a, it's sort of a complicated story. But it takes place in the future. And it's, uh, it, hap it takes place in a zoo that's populated or it's full of robots, robot animals. And the lion is complaining that he's just the sort of toned down, small version of a lion. He can't even roar, he can only purr. And he's very disappointed and frustrated. So that's what you heard there. And then the, the second one that Angelo sang, I made him into a dog. So this is a different opera called uh, Rufus and Rita, and Rufus is a dog. And Rufus finds a moldy old sandwich that he should not eat, and he eats it, and he gets a stomach ache. He gets sick, and then he has this howling aria, the stomach ache. So that's what was going on. So there was no malfunction in the tenor's voice tonight. It was supposed to sound like that. And it, it's a lot of fun for me. As a composer, I like to write things where the, the performer can put some of themselves into it, and so there's a lot of possible different interpretations of especially that aria. And the next piece is for, uh, was originally for trombone? For trombone, yeah. So this is my greatest hit, Bernofsky's greatest hit, which is a trombone piece. It gets, it's probably my most performed piece. And um, some other players have been interested in it. Like, so a French horn player said, hey, could you make a version for horn? And in fact, it's being recorded today. Yeah. Um, and uh, there are other versions too, I can't even think. Oh, there's one for tuba. It's going to come out. So the publisher who published the trombone version is also going to bring it out for tuba and uh, horn, and tonight is the premiere of a version for violin, and that one originated from my own idea because I had the invitation to this concert for which I'm most thankful, and I thought, well, well what else can I put up here for violin and piano? I thought, oh, why not? You know, if, if tuba can play it, violin can certainly play it and sound great doing it, so. This is uh, inspired by two, two Latin rhythms, uh, bossa nova and tango. Do you often uh, get inspired by dances from, from other cultures? I suppose I have actually written a number of pieces that are um, either referring to or sort of subconsciously have sort of undertones of East European folk dance music. So that's some of the earliest music that I heard as a child because my parents used to folk dance a lot and, and they would hold folk dance evenings in their house and I, I would hear the music. So um, I guess it's a little bit in my blood. 
And tell us, uh, I'm very curious, how, how does your uh, work, uh, because you compose quite a lot, so you, you get up uh, very early and start composing or? Um, not that early. <laughs> I'm kind of a, <clears throat> on a late schedule. So I stay up till around 2 a.m. in the morning actually because usually people aren't bothering me. They don't expect anything. They don't expect an answer to an email or anything else, you know, between like midnight and 2 o'clock. So I get a lot of my work done then. Um, and I don't have any sort of a regular routine that I stick to as a composer. It depends on how much stuff I have to get done and when it's due. So sometimes I'll go as much as one or two months without writing anything because I don't have anything due yet and I, I'd like to take a break in between pieces um, just to sort of recharge my composer battery um, because I compose um, based on my intuition and I, I depend on inspiration rather than working something out from a plan. And so if the inspiration isn't coming one day, like, I just, okay, I just, you know, leave the room and just do something else for the rest of that day. Because I have figured out over years of trial and error that my best music comes out of my intuition. And if a piece is too hard to write and I'm fighting with it too much, it's probably just not going to come out great anyway. So, so it's, it's a kind of weird balance that I try to get. I mean, I have to get something done. So I have to, you know, make sure I get at least some work done. But um, I do try to rely on inspiration, and sometimes it comes, sometimes it doesn't. So um, I can't tell you any like regular schedule that I keep to at all. Thank you, Lauren Bernowski. And we are going to hear now the last piece, Latin, two Latin dances. Uh, due to Corona, we are not going to encourage you to to talk to. Um, Lauren, after that, uh, in this room, but maybe if you, if you have some questions, uh, you would do with the necessary distance uh, upstairs uh, if you want to, to give some commentaries. Uh, we are now quite late. That's why we don't open now for, for audience uh, talk. So, two Latin dances, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Oh, thank Lauren. you so much to the Altachmina for having me.